Kathy will be in Berlin, Germany. So we'd love to see you there. And everybody that's watching online as well, especially those on the other side of the country, uh, please be watching the events page for when Kevin's going to be next. He's going to be in Seattle, Washington, uh, Hawaii, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, California, Austin, Texas. So we're just really busy. A lot of great places that Kevin is going to. And uh, uh, my friend Roy, uh, Roy, I don't see him right here at the moment, but if you are anybody in here uh, live in Germany, do you live in Germany? When you go out this door, the first door on the left, it's an overflow. There's a map there of Germany where the, where the warrior fellowships are uh, uh, that Kevin and Kathy, you, you know, you're familiar with that with a Bible study. There's a number of warrior fellowships in Germany, and he's got a little pin uh, on the map of Germany. If you live anywhere in that area, you can sign up and be part of that fellowship. Isn't that cool? Or listen, if you live in Germany or know people that live in Germany, which I'm sure you all do, it'd be good for you to look at the map and say, hey, I got a relative there. Da, 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 da. So that's that first door on the left and you can find a warrior fellowship. Uh, I'm so excited about what God's doing in Switzerland and Germany with the warrior fellowships. We're very exciting. Amen. All right. We're going to take an offering together. And uh, how many watch Kevin online? Okay, so as you know, uh, Kevin has made it clear over the years that this, every time we take an offering, and I'm privileged to do it all over, uh, and uh, it, this is a no pressure, no arm twisting offering, uh, you just give today as the Lord leads in your heart, with, and we do it with joy and abundance, and, uh, and each one of you uh, uh, should be on your seat. There's a little uh, uh, envelope there. You can actually do text to give. If you do that here, you can do text to give, or you can fill that out, and we certainly appreciate everybody's heart. Uh, Kevin is here to serve uh, him and Kathy, and he's just coming to bless these nations. And so we wanted to uh, give you, though, the opportunity to, to, uh, to give into the kingdom. And if you're watching online, there should be a text to give number there uh, as well, and you can do that. So let's pray over the offering. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the opportunity to give and, and be a part of kingdom giving. Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing in Switzerland, all that you're doing around the world. And Lord, we thank you for a, a mighty, mighty harvest of souls in these nations. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Mike. Well, I've got some exciting news since we are here. And uh, many of you know Pastor Curtis. And one thing we've been working on uh, with a school for Kevin's School, Warrior Note School of Ministry, is we wanted to launch Warrior Note School of Ministry Europe. And so it's been on Kevin and Kathy's heart. And so I got some exciting things that we'll be sharing more and more about, but I wanted to give you just a little bit of info that we are currently working with Pastor Curtis and his precious wife on several translations, German, French, Italian, and they're going to be, well, we're going to be launching the school website with courses in the languages all the way from the welcome page to the end, and then we're going to be expanding from there because we want to reach Europe with the gospel, and we want to see leaders, right? We want to see leaders raised up all over the place, so I want to encourage you guys to stay connected, stay connected with Pastor Curtis and his wife because they're going to be heading that up over here, and there's going to be a lot of incredible things that are coming to equip the body because we want to see you guys trained. We want to see you healed. We want to see you on fire. We want to see you starting fellowships and feeding people and really reaching people with the gospel. And so we're working on making that available to everybody that's over here. So we want you to know that there's exciting things happening. And I'll also th uh, share this with you guys that are here. So I have two, um, of, two of the ladies that help us with the school, Becca and Lauren. And if any of you would like to learn more about the school, you can come see them. I've already saw several of you. I got a few here that are graduating next year. I got several of you that are close. We got a few graduates. There's a ton of just incredible things happening. So I know many of you guys are already very involved. But we were able to bring Bre Becca and Lauren with us. So please, if you have questions, if you need anything, let let them help you out. But I also have a special secret. Um, don't tell Kevin about this, okay? But we wanted to do a little something extra for you. And if any of you are interested in taking courses, and these are accredited courses in the United States where you can actually earn accredited associate's degree, and we're coming out with bachelor's, master's, and doctorate, because we believe Christians should be the best. They should be. 
best and you are the best. And so we want to provide that equipping with you. But in, on individual courses, at the end of the year, when you're checking out, there's a place where you can put a coupon code. And if you put the word Europe in there, you can get an additional 25% off your individual courses. So don't tell Kevin. But we wanted to do that special for you guys. So that's on the individual courses. And we know that Kevin and Kathy have made this as in America. Let me give you this. In America, and I know over here it is. it can get quite expensive for education and for uh, college. But Kevin's courses right now and on American standard are 97% cheaper than the average university, which is just unbelievable. Literally the cheapest we've been able to find anywhere. There's nobody cheaper. But it's not about that. It's about making it where it's affordable and accessible for all of you because all of you, like Kevin has said before, are so precious and have so much to offer and it's time to equip you guys. So please jump in, take courses and receive everything you can this weekend because God's got an incredible destiny on your life. Amen? All right, let's give it back to Dr. Kevin Zedai. Okay. okay, hello. I <laughs> <laughs> made it. All right. Well, have you? Did you rest? Did you get to eat or get a little time? Yes? Wow, that was good. How'd you do that? Did you see that lady? She just walked over the, the chairs. <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, we, we are excited. We, we, we are at uh, 30,000 students. Did we break 30,000 yet? Like five, away. five away from 30,000 students. And we started um, in January it'll be four years. Is that correct? Okay, so my, my goal is, is that we get 250,000 students because we need to be able to influence the whole earth. And so with all of you training, just with your associate degree, with your two-year degree, you have, you have studied um, almost 730 hours in order to get your two-year program. So now with the bachelor program, um, you're, we, we're adding another uh, 60 hours and I'm just about through. I've got 38 hours done. I, I've got another, um, I, got, I, I got plenty of time. I got another month, you know, to do another 28 courses. So we're fine. <laughs> so I can do a couple of courses a day, actually. And I'm not kidding you. So, so what's your problem? <laughs> so if I'm going to, I mean, if I'm going to sit for 10 hours a day and film these courses, I, I would want you to at least to take them, you know. But anyway, we'll be doing the bachelor's degree at 60 more hours. Am I, am I right? Yes. Okay. So we have a hundred, it's 120 total, right? 120 t total hours. And then, um, then the master's degree. Um, Still fine -tuning. Huh? Still fine tuning. Still fine tuning that. There's nobody at that level, but uh, we have the master's degree and we'll be filming for that. It's going to be about 30, 40, maybe 50 hours more. And then the doctorate, which you will have to write a book, and I will have to publish it for you. <laughs> so, so to get your doctorate, where you and for your master's, you'll have to do some sort of writing that you publish yourself. But we're going to help you. How do you like that? You all looking at me? <laughs> you guys low on sugar? Do you need some, need a candy bar or something? <laughs> so like wait. So anyway, you're, we're going to be able to provide these things for you. We will be graduating bachelor degree students in March or April. So we'll be done with those courses because um, we still have a few months and I'll be able to record all those when I get home. And then, on, then in the fall, we'll have another graduation and uh, you know, you'll be able to graduate there as well. So how many of you, how many of you enjoy hesitating? How many of you are enjoying just doing nothing? How many, how, how many find it enjoyable just to sit, feel like life is just passing you by? <laughs> nobody does. Like, nobody likes to be left out, right? But, you know, there's always opportunities 
And this is the thing that you've got to be mindful of, is that we are literally creating opportunities at Warrior Notes to, to help you to insert yourself into history and, and change history. You literally have the power to change the direction of your life. People do it all the time by doing nothing. You continue in the direction you're going, and that's why I ask you, how many of you like where you're going? How many of you enjoy like watching things just pass you by? You've got to insert yourself into it. You got to get into the game. You got to come dressed as though the coach is going to put you in. You, you've got to be ready. You just show up to church expecting God to use you or to, to have an opportunity. So it's the same thing with the school. I'm creating an opportunity for you, making it so reasonable. And we give free courses, too. And it, there are so many opportunities for those who are in the military uh, that we give great discounts. If you're a single parent, um, you get discounts. If you are a teenager, you get discounts. You know? I mean, I, I'll give you a discount. I'll just make one up if you, if you need help. <laughs> if you wear glasses, I'll give you a discount. <laughs> if you don't wear glasses, I'll give you a discount. Okay, the bottom line is, is that I know, I know how it works down here. It's, it's education. It's, it's being informed. It's, it's acquiring understanding. Not just knowledge, but understanding. You've You've got to be able to take what you learn and apply it. Does everybody understand that? Yeah. Apply, ap application, okay? So all of you, all of you have an opportunity to take free courses and get college credit for it. I mean, I, I paid, I paid uh, several hundred dollars per credit hour and got, I'm up to my doctorate. And I, and I had to pay for that not like what you're doing. So I'm, I'm doing this because I didn't like the big college bills I had. I didn't like uh, leaving college and feeling like I didn't have application. When I got out, I had more questions about God than when I went in. <laughs> now, how could that be? In other words, Jesus, when he spoke, he was for the people. But he wanted change. He wanted transformation. He was wanting them to have a better quality of life. He wanted them to be disciples. Well, what does disciples mean? Well, people that followed a rabbi around like Jesus, Jesus was considered a teacher, a rabbi. They followed him around and they learned, listen, they learned his disciplines. So disciples are those who learn the disciplines of their teacher. So after three and a half years, they expected, they expected to, to be able to produce. Jesus expected them to produce. He sent them out. They were surprised. They go, we, we used your name and demons left. They were surprised. He said, don't be surprised. They healed the sick. He said, you're going to do the same things I'm doing. You're going to do greater things than these because I go to my father. When they couldn't cast out the demon and the man uh, went to customer services and complaining about his disciples. Well, Jesus was working the desk that day and he said, how long am I going to be with you? He looks at his disciples. He goes, you, 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 un, you perverse generation, you unbelieving bunch of, you know, what, when are you going to get this? He said, how long will I be with you? Why did you doubt? And he turned and he cast that demon out. And they're like, how'd you do that? He goes, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. Well, that wasn't, Jesus wasn't praying and fasting at the time. They had lost the edge. They had lost it. Because if you remember, they had already cast out devils. This kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. So maybe they were encountering a higher level. Maybe they hadn't, um, they hadn't um, approached it the correct way. We don't know, understand what was going on completely there. But Jesus said, you need to press in a little bit more. And he said, I, I'm not going to be with you much longer. And he wasn't, three and a half years. So why, why do people hesitate? See, I don't understand 
the amount that it costs per credit hour for you to take courses when I had to pay, uh, you know, sometimes hundreds of times more than what you would pay credit hour in order to get my degree. And what I'm giving you is the things that they did, they missed. You know, you can learn the Greek and the Hebrew and not know the Bible. And the devils don't care about Greek and Hebrew. What they care about is you not getting it and doing something with it. Everybody understand? Okay, so I'm saying this because when an opportunity presents itself, you have to discern at that moment if, if it's good to acquire knowledge that is applicable. In other words, if you can have understanding, then you need to obtain that. And that's what Solomon said. In all you're getting, get understanding. That's what he said in Proverbs all the time. Like every other chapter, he said, in all you're getting, get understanding. So, when you hear something, what you take away when you hear something is what you understood. Can you go and do it? Not repeat it to me. <laughs> it's, like, it's like Sven, we got Bruno here, we got Sven and Bruno, pilots. And um, they can pass and answer all the questions on an oral exam with the FAA, but then they're going to the simulator or they're going to the airplane and he's going to sit there and he's not, he's going to say, okay, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And he's back here. So they can spout off all the statistics, everything about the airplane. Very impressive. But then when they go out to fly, do they apply that during the flight? So there is that knowledge and then there's application. They're both tests. You have to, you have to pass both of them. Okay, so all of you, you can spout off your scripture verses, but do the demons trouble, tremble over you quoting scripture? Well, they can quote scripture. And they probably know some Bible more than you do. Okay, but the power is in how much is in you and how much you know and understand. Okay, so why, why have you hesitated? Because maybe you're afraid. Well, what are you afraid of? Are you afraid of failure? Are you afraid of the unknown? Why are you afraid of the dark? Why is it okay when the lights are on? Let's turn all the lights off and we'll see what happens. It's, why would you be afraid of the dark? It's the same thing as when it's light. It's the same room. Is there like ghosts that come out? Or is there some spooky things that come out when it's dark? It's the same thing. But see, this is what happens. When the lights go out, nobody moves, nobody does anything. Your bedroom... It's fine during the day. It might be even scarier than at night because you haven't cleaned it. But when the lights go out, why are people afraid of the dark? Why, why, why do people hesitate to do what they know they're supposed to do? And I think that it's fear of failure. But what if I told you that failure is not the end of things? What if I told you that failure is actually part of the learning process? What if, what if I told you that you need to know what you don't know and what you can't do? Maybe you need to know your limitations in order to improve. And this is why people don't get any better at what they're doing is because they won't let God in and let him take you further. So what does God say? He, he says, I light the pathway where your feet are going to tread. He says that several times in the book of Psalms. He says, I light where your feet are walking, and I also light the path ahead of you. So there's the immediate step before you, the next step that I take. Hopefully I don't trip. But if I look down, it's lit. But God also lights where you're going. 
So it is known if you let God do it. If you don't, then it's unknown. And that's why you hesitate. Okay, so we can go home now. That was all I had to say. <laughs> why, do you, why are you afraid? Are you afraid of the unknown or are you afraid to fail? Well, both of those things are resolvable. Well, did you ever think you're not going to fail? I mean, isn't there a 50-50 chance? Are you going to let some disease slow you down? You're still alive. You made it through. So let's just, let's just ramp it up again. The Lord has given us everything we need for life and godliness. That's what the scripture says. Peter said that we've been given promises. And through those promises, we can be partakers. It says in chapter 1 of 2 Peter, it says, He has given us precious promises that through these we can be partakers of the divine nature. So we can be a partaker of the divine nature? Or do you want to throw Peter out? You going to kick him out of church? Okay, so he's still in, right? He's still in the Bible. So don't you think that what he said is still valid then? In other words, how about you? How would you like to tap into the promises that God gave and that we can do these things and we can have what we need for life and godliness? That's what, that's what God said through Peter. I mean, he was an apostle. You've you got to accept this. Your next step is a supernatural step. It's not supposed to be normal. But you don't do it out of fear. You've got to know, you've got to have the understanding. What would you do tomorrow if you couldn't fail? Did you ever think that maybe you won't fail? There's quality decisions that you can make today that will guarantee tomorrow. Did you know that? There are things that you can do today that I can predict tomorrow. What I can do is I can sit and talk to you for 10 minutes and just let you talk. And then I'm going to tell you where you're going tomorrow just by what you're saying. What did we just talk about before the break? James, he was an apostle. He said, and he was the pastor of Jerusalem, he said, that the tongue is a rudder for your life. It steers your whole life. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, he said, you will be held accountable for every idle word that comes out of your mouth. Well, what if you spoke something that wasn't idle? What if you had full power? What if you just spoke the direction you were going? Well, then you would be in Mark eleven twenty three 23 and 24, where Jesus said, speak to the mountain and it'll be removed. If you believe in your heart that what you say with your mouth shall come to pass, it shall be done. Is that still in the Bible? Well, Jesus was more than an apostle, wasn't he? He is telling us that our tongue and our words are very powerful. He said... That you can believe in your heart that what you say with your mouth, if you believe in your heart and you say it with your mouth, he said, you shall have what you say, not what you believe. But you believe in your heart, but you have to say it. What is the saying? That is application. It has to manifest. You have to say it. I mean, if you want to bring Jesus into it, right? Okay. So if Jesus is in the room because he said he's going to be with us, and if two or more are gathered in my name, I am where? In the midst, right? Well, how many do we have here? I, I don't know. I see. I know. Is there two? I don't know. Is there two? Three? 
There's two, right? There, so more than enough to create Jesus coming into this, into this meeting, okay? So if he's there, if we agree touching anything, he said, it shall be done for you. Is that still in the Bible? Okay, so why did he say these two things? He said, if you agree, I'll be in your midst. And then he said in another place, whatever you agree upon, two or three of you, it shall be done. Why did he say both of those things? I'm glad you asked, because I'm going to tell you. He's in the midst to sign it off. So if I sit with you, I want to hear where you're going. I don't want to hear what you can't do. Why would you do that? Why would you sit and if you had 10 minutes with me, like everybody wants 10 minutes with me. Well, would you want to tell that 10 minutes? Wouldn't you want to say something that I could agree with you with? And it better be forward, not backwards. It better not be like what you did in your past. I don't want to hear about your past. It's gone. I don't want to hear about now because you're stuck in the mud. I want to hear where you're going. These are the kind of people that change history. The people that change history, they didn't want to be normal because everybody was normal. Just like you, you're all neutral. You're a neutral country, right? So what advantage is that? Well, you got good chocolate, okay. But neutral, neutral is really, it sounds like you're just leveraging your position all the time. For liability's sake. But see, liability causes you to also have opportunities to triumph and to have victory. See, it's not all going to be failure. So why do you hesitate? You got opportunities every single day to, to jump in there and help somebody that can't pay you back. You just step in, you, you, you help someone. You give them something, and you never expect it back. You do it to someone who can't pay you back. You help people. You help your church. You help, you help, and you don't expect it back. You let God pay you back. There are so many opportunities, even in this room. There are people that need a word. They need encouragement. They need a friend. They need somebody who can sit and listen to you talk. But if they do listen to you talk and you need help, you got to remember that that tongue is a very powerful rudder. All of you will remember this night. When you get to heaven, you'll remember that the word of God was spoken here and you were given encouragement. I have quoted so much scripture that we could quit right now. We, you've heard more Bible than most people hear in months in a church. And it's only my introduction of six minutes. Okay, now those scriptures are Jesus speaking and Paul speaking and Peter speaking. All your heroes. And Jesus, your Messiah. But with, with these people, they are fully convinced of what they believe. So they don't have hesitancy. The thing is, is if you don't know something or understand something, you need to get rid of that. And the only way you're going to get rid of that is to get over yourself, get over your fears, and start to acquire knowledge and understanding. Start to gain that understanding. Now, there's two ways to do that. You can, you can um, get under someone that will mentor you that's already there, and they will take you there in an accelerated manner. Or you can study yourself. I would do both. Because God will send you somebody if you start studying yourself. But you've got to sow into your future today because you can't expect something to happen tomorrow that you didn't sow into today. You've got to give God an opportunity to work with something in your life. He works with his word. Like we talked about in Isaiah 55, he sends his word out. And it goes out and accomplishes what he intended. It returns to him. And the Bible says it's not void. In other words, it doesn't come back empty. And it says that it accomplishes all the things that God sent his word to do. Okay, so all of you, 
all of you, everybody's listening, right? Okay. I don't feel like I got your attention. You, you guys, can we pass out candy? We, Pastor Curtis, you have candy? You all are like, I mean, you have espresso here, right? I mean, you, no, no, I'm just kidding with y'all. You, you, you looked a little shocked. Well, what'd you expect? Did you expect me to be some like little weak person, you know, and kind of like, you know, you know, you might want to try God, you know, <laughs> try prayer. No, I didn't come here. I didn't come here to pacify your, your, your emotions or your weakness. I'm here because the only way that you're going to grow up in the Lord is you've got to, to invest in yourself spiritually. And what I found is, is that people are afraid to fail. I was just told this just, just not that long ago by, by people that I've known for a long time. And there's this fear of failure. But see, failure reveals what you need. It's not bad. It's not an, it might feel like a negative experience, but it's a growing experience. You all are still alive. You made it through the disease of the week, the Greek alphabet. They didn't even make it to the end of the alphabet. They, they're running out of animals to name it after, but you're making it through. It's a, it's, we're in a hard time. But at what point do you get to the advantage of all this, to where you see that you have eternal life, you're going to go to heaven and live forever, so why don't you just take a two-by-four and start swinging it at the devil's head? Why are you afraid of him? If you're going to heaven and God still gives you breath today, you should be doing everything you can to improve yourself. You should be sowing into your spiritual life. You should be sowing in bettering your career, bettering your position here on the earth, uh, gaining relationships, opening yourself up to God and saying, what opportunities are there? Angels are sent to minister, it says, for those who are going to inherit salvation. That's what it says in the book of Hebrews, which they're quoting Psalms. Okay, so he sends his angels, they're ministers of fire, it says. It says that they only do his bidding, which means he is telling them what to do, and his intentions are known, and then they're sent to do those words to fulfill God's heart. But in Psalms 91, it says that they are assigned to you with special assignments to complete certain tasks on your behalf. If you read Psalms 91, I mean, it's still in your Bible, right? Okay, it says that he assigns his angels concerning you so that you don't even stub your toe against a stone. So it is possible not to trip, which means it's possible not to fail. Would you all promise me that you'll look at failure as a learning process and it's not over? If you're still alive, you passed the test. You're still alive. Today, you have an opportunity to change your routing, to change your life, but you can change other lives because people are depending that you don't even know. People are depending upon you to be faithful because one day you're going to come across their path and you're going to change their life forever. Amen. And they don't even know you. You don't know them yet. But one day you're going to encounter someone and you're going to change their life. You're going to touch their life. And they are depending upon that visitation with you, even though they don't know you yet. Does everybody understand what I just said? Because yes. I'll repeat it 40 times until you get it. We, we have all night. I mean, when you think about it, I'm already in tomorrow where I live. I'm living in my future right now. This hasn't even happened in the United States yet. I get Jimmy with it all. I got seven hours to Jimmy with it. Okay, so all of you. Did I just lose my mic? That's interesting. Stop hesitating. Fix the hesitation. The reason why you hesitate is because you don't know it good enough. 
If you knew the truth, you would live by it. If you knew that angels were here to help you, you would follow God's voice because you would know that they're going to step right in. I mean, Sw Switzerland has angels, right? I, I don't think they like are locked out, are they? I mean, do angel are angels allowed here? I mean, do is there like, I don't know, I didn't notice, but is there like, are they get stuck in customs or what? what? <laughs> angels are here too, right? Do you think that, do you think that, like Jesus said, listen, don't mess around with children. He said, don't hurt children. Don't, don't offend them. He said that their angels always see the face of their father in heaven. He said, don't touch children wrongly because your, their angels will report you. Well, what do you think if you did something right to a child? Wouldn't you get reported for that? So let's just start doing things for ch children. Okay, so when you grow up and you're not a child anymore, I mean, and you still act like a child, but you're not a child anymore. Do you think you lose your angel? I hope not, because you all need help. I need help. I need a couple of angels. So you don't lose your angel when you grow up. So your angel always sees the face of your father in heaven. Right now. So why don't you do something that you get reported for that's good? You don't have to get a citation all the time. See how we are? We think negative. We think we're always doing something wrong because something doesn't work out. You're going to find out what happened to me when I died on the operating table is I found out that it is more up to us what happens in this life than you would want to admit. When I was in heaven, I saw that I was passing up opportunities all the time to change history, to change how I was going to end up. Constantly, God was giving me opportunities and angels were setting up, and I wasn't discerning it. I was letting them pass by. And I saw that it's more up to us now because, I mean, it's clear in the Bible Please listen to me, because Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. He's not standing at the right hand of God. He's seated. And it says that he's waiting for his enemies now to become his footstool. What does that mean? That means when a king was defeated, they brought him in, and the king that ruled in that in domain, he put his heel up on the, the other king's head. He made it a, a footstool. So now it says that God is waiting for his enemies to become his footstool through the church, through you. You're the church. It's not the building. This, it's you. You're the church. You're the body of Jesus Christ. You, that's what Jesus said. He talked about he was the head. You're the body. He prayed for us. And I found when I had this experience that it was more up to me, and Jesus told me that. And I thought, this isn't going to go well when I go back and talk about this. And I found that you, well, you know this. I mean, people, nope, you don't get anything just sitting waiting for it. And people just don't give you anything. I mean, you have to do something. And this, this is why I believe that God has sent me here. When he, when he told me in my heart to come here, we were planning, like I said, to go to Dubai next. And we were not able to get the proper venue to go there. And so we decided to go to Croatia and then to Berlin and then try again next year. And we're just going to call Bruno and we're going to say, Bruno, can you take us to Dubai? But we're supposed to come here. We're going to come here anyway. But why were we sent here? I'm telling you what it is. All of you are chosen of God. Yeah. Amen. Okay. So Psalms, Psalms clearly says that, that a book was written about each one of us. And in heaven, these things are set as God's will. But how many times does God's will 
get accomplished because Jesus, while he was on the earth in Acts 10, 38, he said, he went around doing good and healing everyone that was oppressed of the devil. Pastor Mike, did I quote that right? I mean, what did I, did I, I didn't mess with it, did I? That's exactly what it says. Okay, so Jesus only did the will of the Father. He said, I don't do any of these works. These are the works of my Father through me. He said, the words I'm speaking, they're not mine. They're my Father's. Okay, so if he went around doing good, not evil, and healing everyone. Did I mention everyone? That was oppressed of the devil. So it even says what was causing it. You know what it says in, in other translations of the Bible? The same thing. Says it in the Greek, the Hebrew, the homebrew. The people that just make it up. It's just, it says the same thing. Okay, so if Jesus was doing the will of the Father, then he was healing everyone, doing good. Then why would you say that God is making you sick when Jesus didn't do that? Please, everybody listen to me. When did Jesus ever? make someone sick? When did he ever in the, in, in the Bible make somebody sick? He never did. He never did evil. He said the thief, John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But he said what? I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. Not just life, but abundant life. That'll get you kicked out of some churches. You start talking about that. You want to get kicked out of church? Start talking about the responsibility you have. Start talking about the fact that God wants to do miracles, signs and wonders in your life, not just in some people that are holy, because you're all holy too, because you've been made holy by the blood of Jesus, which is the only requirement to be holy. Did you know that? It was his blood. It wasn't your behavior. You're kidding. You're going to mess up. You're going to mess up before you get home tonight. So you're only holy in church? No. The most effective is when you're holy out there. Well, what's holy? Set apart. Well, I can do that. Your behavior will come, but your goal is to be set apart. Okay, so God, God chooses you. I told you in Acts 17, if you read Acts 17 and you also read what Jesus said in Acts 1, in Acts 1 it says that it was not given to us to understand all the times and the seasons, but you shall receive power from on high when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's what Jesus said in Acts 1, before he rose. He was already risen, but he went up into heaven after he taught. Okay, so he said that. So what he was saying was, we don't know everything about what's going to happen next. It's not for us to know these things. It says it was reserved for the Father. In Acts 17, it says that each, well, I already quoted this, but some of you are new. I can notice that almost half of you are new from this afternoon. The Acts 17 says that God knew every person and every race of people that would live in each generation and had placed them strategically on the earth. And he had a plan and a purpose for every person. That's what it says in Acts 17. I checked, it's still there. So because of that, you all are supposed to be where you're at. However, nothing will be done about it unless you're activated and what does it say? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Well, guess what? I'm prophesying to you. I'm giving you the word right now. You all are lit up. And Switzerland is shifting. Okay. But say, all of you go back to where you live and it starts to shift. You know, you might gain some friends. You might lose some friends. You can't judge it because sometimes separation happens. And when you get promoted, you, you, did you know you lose friends sometimes? Why? Because they have a choking point. Ooh. 
I'm glad you're happy. <laughs> I'm happy to spread it. Can you sit over here? <laughs> Do you have a sister? Go over here. Okay. The choking point. Please get to your choking point as fast as possible and then upgrade yourself tomorrow. If you have to duct tape your hands to the handlebar to get ready for tomorrow, because I want the choking point to be about this much higher tomorrow. I want you to continually reach the failure point every day. Do you have, Pastor Curtis, do you have WD-40 here? WD-40, right? Do you know how that all started? WD-1. It failed 39 times. You're laughing. That's the truth. WD-40 passed. It displaced water. Water displacement number 40. Am I right? So what number are you? <laughs> Does it matter? All that matters is how you end up. If you're in the hundreds, what does it matter? What if you have a bunch of zeros behind your name? It doesn't matter. How you finish is as you continue to allow yourself to grow and stop being afraid of failure. You're not a failure. I believe that most people attract failure. If I could, I would go and snip that wire in your brain. Just, maybe it's the red wire. You know the one that you're not supposed to cut? Don't cut the red wire. Well, maybe it's the red wire that I need to cut. Don't cut the red wire. Yeah, maybe that's the one. No, in other words, you, you usually grow up f f uh, wired to fail. And Jesus didn't teach that way. Jesus, when he made man, he made him in the image of God. In the image of God, Genesis 126. We were made in the image of God originally. So... God doesn't fail, so we weren't made to fail originally, so we, f we fell. We're in a broken world. Well, you guys are neutral here, so you're fine, right? <laughs> and you got chocolate, you know, so. But listen, I heard you got a lot of gold, too, you know. Gold and chocolate. I mean, this is, this is almost heaven. But see, neutral isn't going to cut it. Jesus didn't create us to fail. And that's been the problem. We don't understand ourselves. We don't understand our choking point because we don't understand that we weren't made to ever fail. Now think about this. We are wired and we expect to succeed. That is why you don't understand yourself. It is foreign to you to pray and not get your prayer answered. And you feel frustrated when it doesn't happen because you're not you weren't made to fail. So when you're born again, when the Spirit of God comes in you and you're a new creation, your spirit is fixed. God has made you new. Old things have passed away. So you believe in your heart, and that's why you have to speak with your mouth from your heart, and it shall be done. Jesus didn't say, believe with your head. He said, believe in your heart that what you say with your mouth shall happen and you shall have it. Mark 11, 23 and 24. Okay, so your choking point has to do with this. Now, if I'm talking to someone and they're talking out of this, it's not going to be supernatural. And it's going to be low life. And the Bible it was a city called Lodabar. Now, I know what happened. I know what happened. You know how the, Egyptian, the Egyptians wanted to hold the Israelis. And so Israel left Egypt. But guess what? They took Egypt with them inside. They left Egypt, but they took Egypt with them. 
So when they got out in the desert, they're supposed to believe God and trust God, and God was waiting for them to acknowledge Him as their God. And they wouldn't even come up on a mountain to talk with Him. They were afraid. So they sent Moses up, and then God says, where's the people? And remember what happened? He got upset. He said, okay. And he got mad. He said, anybody touches the mountain, they're, they're crispy critters, you know. <laughs> what happened? They took Egypt with them because that's the way they were wired. They were slaves. But see, he called them children of Israel, not slaves of Israel. They were children of, of Israel. They were children of God. We're called children of God. The, today I said we were friends of God. I read you verses where we're friends. We're actually friends. Because Jesus said, I share with you the intimate details of what my father is doing in the kingdom. He said, you are no longer servants. You are friends, right? I said that. Do you remember that? It's just been two hours. <laughs> New Testament, under redemption, we are friends of God, which means he sits and he shares the intimate secrets and details, it says, of what he's doing. We're included in on that. We're not servants in the house. We're children in the house. So your choking point should be higher every day as you acquire understanding. So literally in heaven, it's impossible for you to stay the same. In heaven, when you get to heaven, you look back, you see like I did. I saw it's impossible for us to not improve every day because the world is set up for you to fail and so if you continue on in your journey of discovery, you cannot stay the same because you're going to encounter things. So whether it's negative or positive, it helps me. It helps you. It doesn't matter what happens. It's how you deal with it. What's your choking point? And why do you hesitate? Are you afraid of your choking point? Have you, do you, you know when you have enough. See, you're getting over yourself. So you all need to get over yourself. You're way too complicated. I think I'm just going to cut all your red wires right now. I think you all need to be, have permission to be yourself. Amen? This should be preached in church every week. Jesus did it. Why can't the ministers do this? Why can't we preach good news? All of heaven is rejoicing that you are hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But all heaven will rejoice tomorrow when they see it manifest. Because there are so many things that God has for you. Sorry, I'm making it hard for you. I appreciate, I appreciate your, all your work. She's really good with it. All right, I'll just stay back 15 feet. All right, now listen. All of you have opportunities that God has already created. Paul said that all the good works that we were going to do were in Christ from the foundation of the world. How can God do that when you haven't been born yet? Because his plan, based on foreknowledge, doesn't manipulate your will. He just plans it as though you're going to do the right thing. He plans it as though you're going to choose him and follow him. But how many people really do that? But your books are written before you were born. But he doesn't manipulate your free will. That is the biggest problem. It's people's free will. If you know anybody that has a problem with free will, send them to me. Oh, that's all of you. I'll tell you why you have a problem with free will. Is you, is you, you literally do nothing. And in your doing nothing, you're exercising your right. But you're, you become like your country, neutral. You got a lot of gold and chocolate. But one day, Switzerland will have to step up to the plate. And I believe they will. And, all, and Germany, and there's oh, how many nations are there? 11? Right now, 11 nations watching. I, I saw we had 10,000 views from this afternoon already. 10,000 people. 
I'm still in my future. <laughs> I mean, at home, they're still, I think they're just getting up right now. So Paul said that all the, the good works that we were to do were already predestined in Christ. Well, don't be afraid of predestination because it's, it's not manipulating your will. It's that God knows things ahead of time, and he does things as though people are going to do the right thing and choose correctly and do something about it. However, how many of us really get it that we were given talents and that those talents, it's not how many you got. It's what you did with what you got, if you look at the parables. So whether you have one or ten, it's what you do with it. you got to find out in this life by discovery what those talents are. And I wouldn't wait too long because you need to get a return on what, what God gave you. Those good works are written as though you're going to do them. So it doesn't work to be neutral because free will doesn't work to be neutral. Free will is not sitting around and waiting for something to happen. Free will is doing something and making it happen. You got to make it happen. Jesus had to come. He came down to your level and now it's time to go up to his level. He did his part of the deal. Now you do your part. Ephesians 2, 6, and Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, talks about us being seated with him now. So why would you wear a cross with Jesus on it? He's not on the cross. Why would you have a symbol with Jesus hanging on the cross? What's the big deal about the cross? What about a throne? What about an empty tomb? When's the last time you saw an empty tomb on, a, on, a, on somebody's necklace? <laughs> I mean, Jesus isn't on a cross anymore. He completed his whole journey, and he is seated now at the right hand of God, and he's interceding for all of us. Why is he interceding for us? Please do something. That's what he's interceding. Oh, please do something. He can't do anything else. Did you know that he is seated, and he has done everything he's going to do? Am I right? I saw, I saw him when I, was, when I was given that opportunity to be there and sent back. He was seated at the right hand of God. And he's going to stay there until the Father says, come back for my bride. Come back for the body. He's going to stay seated because he's accomplished everything. He's done everything he's going to do about the devil. He's done everything he's going to do about you. It's all up to us to choose now. And with the spirit that's been given, the same spirit, it says this in Romans, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is dwelling in you. And it said, Paul said it will quicken your body, your mortal body. Well, what does quicken mean? Ch -ch Clear? Oh. Well, if you have a heartbeat, you don't need revived. Why do you need revival if you're still alive? Everybody wants revival. Well, you don't need revival if you're breathing. Everybody wants revival. They want the church to have revival. But people are still alive. We don't need revival. We need our seat to get hot to where we get hot pants. We need to get hot enough to where we start moving. If you see the devil, tell him I'm coming to the next country, too, and do the same thing. If you see the devil, let him know I'm coming. I'm going to do this everywhere. I'm doing this everywhere. Not just I'm not picking on you all. I'm telling you, you need to know this. When you get to heaven, you're going to find this out. This is what happened to me. I didn't want to come back. But I was sent back because I saw that we got it wrong. We're waiting on God, and he's waiting on us. He has given us what we need. 
We use a very small portion of our brain. The way we were made, we're made to be ambidextrous. We're, we're made to use both hands, both sides of the brain. We're made to multitask. Some of you can't even talk on your phone and drive, you know, so they have to make laws because you're dangerous. God does hundreds of thousands of executions a second and still has time to talk to Jesus who's seated beside him. God can handle you. He can handle your problems. He can handle your life. My wife's leaving. I hope she's not going to the airport. <laughs> you locked the airplane, right? <laughs> Come back. <laughs> so message must have been too hard. It's like, listen, God can handle you. He made you. He made you. You're complicated. Just ask your family. You're very complicated. You're very complicated. You're made, you're made very, very intricately. There's lots of wires. Just cut the red wire, but you're, there's lots of wires up there. There's, you don't even understand yourself. You make yourself cry. We're very complicated, but God understands us. The reason why we're complicated, listen, we were never made to live in a broken world. I'm telling you the truth. If you want to know what I learned in heaven, you don't have to buy my book. I will tell you, we were never made to be in an imperfect world. We were never made to be poor or sick or die, ever. And that'll get you kicked out of church. But that's the truth. There's none of this stuff in heaven, and God made the earth like that before we messed it up. Okay, so the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's the one that teaches people to fail, to teach people to... To, to invent ways of making you sick, making you enslaved to death. There's nothing neutral. It's set up. This system down here is set up that you don't win. I mean, just last week, I went in one direction, 120 knot headwind. Well, coming back, guess what? I got a tailwind, right? No. I still had 40 or 50 knot headwind. How does that work? I thought I sowed into my future. It's a broken world. You got this swirl called Ian. So, uh, you know, one direction headwind, then you should have a tailwind coming back, right? You should be pushing your airplane. You should be making fuel. You should be making time. But see... I, was, I said, how is this even possible? Ian, a hurricane. Sometimes these things happen. Can you handle the unpredictable? Can you handle discrepancies? Can you handle when things don't go right? Because that's what life's all about. You know the USB? USB? There's only two ways to plug it in, so why does it take three times to get it right? <laughs> totally against the odds. It's there, there is no randomness. See, you think, oh, I got a 50-50 chance. No, if the devil's involved, you have no chance. So you're going to try something? When mathematically it should only take two tries to get it right and three, you have to do three. Do you want to live like that? Or do you want something that's guaranteed? What you do is this. You do something for somebody that cannot pay you back. You help people because you care, not because you want repayment. You, you do something for someone else. And I'll tell you how to do it. Tonight when you go home, you pray and you sow into tomorrow. You sow into your spiritual life for someone else. You become a seed. You become a solution. See, really, what I saw was that we are all solutions to someone else's problem. We are problem solvers, and you are a solution, and you're being sent, guided missile, to someone else. 
I know that. I know that every person that is alive is connected to everyone. And I know that every one of us has something inside of us that someone else needs. And that's the way it's set up. It's called supply and demand. It's, it's, it creates the demand because God places it in you and everyone else around you needs it. Demand is based on supply. And supply is based on demand. It pulls on each other. But if you are the only one that can fix the electricity in this building, please talk to me because I need your help. <laughs> but if you're an electrician and you're the only one in this area and we need you now, guess what? Your value just went through the roof. Okay, so God does that on purpose with each one of you. You have something inside of you that puts your value through the roof. Why? Because God creates that flow to keep us all together. There would be no war if we discerned people's value. If we loved people and we honored people and we just, if, you know, not everybody can be an electrician. Those are the two. There's a couple rules I, oh, I'm sorry. There's a couple rules I play by. I do not touch electricity and I do not touch plumbing. I have never won. And so I know just to opt out. I just go to call somebody because I'm not going to mess with that. So I live in New Orleans. I don't pet alligators. You can't win. Why would you pet an alligator? Well, some of your friends, so-called friends, they look like alligators, so why do you pet them? Why do you spend time with people that bite you and want to eat you? Why would you play in the street when you have a park? So I don't play in the street, and I don't pet alligators. I don't mess with plumbing or electricity. Why? Because I know my limits. I know that I can walk away from those things to live another day. Amen. And that's what you got to do. you got to know when it's time to just back out. But you don't have to try at life. Why don't you do something you can win at? Well, what's inside of you? Because that's what you can win at. It's not what's inside your neighbor. It's just what's inside of you, and God knows what that is. Okay, that was my introduction. All right. So what time is it? No, what time is it anyway? Huh? What time is it? Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock? Oh, my. Where? Well, y'all, y'all want to listen a little bit more? Or you, you good? You, you're all good? Okay. Well, then we'll just close out, right? They're good. <laughs> okay. So you got to decide today, and this is what I did. I took a blank piece of paper. I took a blank sheet of paper, eight and a half by eleven, and I wrote out God's will. I'll get you kicked out of church. I wrote out God's will. I was, at, I, was in, I was in college. I still have it somewhere, don't I? I was at Rama Bible Training Center, second year, sitting in class, and the Lord said, write out my will. And I go, you know what? I am not qualified to do that. He said, yes, you are. He said, you've sown into your spiritual life like you're going to do. And I was qualified enough. He said, write out my will. So I drew out God's will on an eight and a half by 11, which included being a pilot, including having a college degree, including everything that you can imagine, including a house and a car. I even drew out a bunch of books that I would write. And musical instruments. Everything on that page has come to pass. So now i got to get another blank piece of paper. Why? Because I did something. But I started with knowing what my choking point was. And knowing that tomorrow it's going to be a different point. I've got to improve. I've got to not be afraid. So I was afraid of heights. That's going to go well with being a pilot. So... (laughs) 
I just jumped out of airplanes. I jumped out of airplanes until I liked it, and then I quit. That's what I did. I'm serious. I faced my fears. And they wouldn't take me up any higher without oxygen. I said, well, get me oxygen. I want to go to 21,000. Oh, you guys are in meters. You can do the conversion. <laughs> I did it until I wasn't afraid anymore. And then I got to where I could fly an airplane straight and level. And I realized I was afraid to upset. So I went to upset training. I got trained. I went spin training. 10 hours of spin training. Then I went to get my qualification in upset training where I could recover in jets. Then I thought, I'm, I'm really good. I'm really good now. I'm fine. I'm, I'm stable. And then I went and flew a fighter jet. And I pulled G's until I could hardly see. It was like... All I could feel was a stick in my stomach, and he's like yelling, pull harder, pull harder. I'm like, I can't see. My, my head weighed 60 pounds. I mean, I have a big head as it is, but this is like 60. I don't know how many kilograms it is, but you know, kilos. Five Gs. I increased my choking point. And what it did was it got rid of my fear, which got rid of my hesitation. That's good. That's good. It's not unknown anymore. So the fear of the unknown needs to become known. And then there's no fear anymore. It's just known. When you know what to do because you practice over and over again, and you learn to do it in an emergency, that's when it becomes part of you. Then you pass your test. But up until then, you know like how parrots are. You can train a parrot to say anything. They can say anything you train them to do, but they don't know what they're saying. A parrot doesn't know what they're saying, but it sounds like they do. <laughs> well, you don't want to be a parrot and quoting scripture and not know what you're saying. Oh, boy. So are you a parrot, Christian? And this is what I found out. After I died and I came back, and the doctors were so surprised. And I told them everything they said while they were operating on me, and they got really nervous. I told them the whole procedure, which I wasn't be able to look at, but I was watching them do it. And then they knew that something had happened. But this is the thing. I'm not afraid to die anymore because I already did that. I actually got the T-shirt and the hat and the movie to, to, to be coming out soon. Once you have all of that, you're not afraid to die anymore because you've already done that. So you want to live. So once you get rid of the fear of death, you actually learn to live. Yeah. Now, this happened to my boss at Southwest Airlines. He called me in. He goes, I heard it. I heard about your experience, and, you know, I heard you got a book out, and you're on TV and stuff. And I go, yeah, I'm quitting, just so you know. <laughs> no. I said, he said, he said can, you, can you tell me what happened? And I said, well, am I in trouble? He said, no, you're not in trouble. I just want everybody talking about it. So I said, okay, this is what happened. He goes, well... You know, you know, last year I had cancer, and my boss is telling me, I had cancer and I was doing chemo, and he said, I was so sick that I was in the bathroom, and I just told God, just let me die. And he said, I was all alone, and I shouldn't have been, but he said, I was all alone. And he said, I heard footsteps in the house, and it came into the bathroom, and I looked and there were sandals with a white robe, and he looked up, and it was Jesus. And Jesus took him. He doesn't even believe this way, but he does now. <laughs> but took him and hugged him. And he said, when you learn how to live, I'll let you die. <laughs> and he lived. He got healed. So maybe you need to not be afraid anymore. 
you know, eternal life is just one breath away. But see, really, you have it inside of you. And really, when you think about it, you're never really going to die. You're just going to transfer over. And it's so quick. I mean, I've already done it. It's really easy. There's no paperwork. No customs. It's so fast that at first you don't even know you died. There was no pain, no regret. Never did I say, oh, please, can I go back? No, never. Uh, honestly, when you pass away, I would, I would fall here on the ground. You'd be wanting to do CPR. I'd be standing right over here saying, please do not touch me. Do not revive me. I would, no, everybody away. Put orange cones around me. I would. I'd be like, do not revive me. I would be trying to push you out, off, off my body. I wouldn't even want to come back. There's no pain. But then I'm locked out of this realm, which means all my books are sealed now. I can't do another thing. Get, I cannot get another transaction or credit for anything. Everything's sealed, and then it goes right to audit. And what God does is he takes the template of your life that he made in heaven before you were born, and he lays it over your life, and he measures it up with what he had and what you did. It happens in a, a fraction of a second, and he stands there and smiles at you the whole time. He just looks at you and smiles, and he says, well done, and then you get the audit, and then... The, what you did with what you were given only, you have rewards for that. And, you, and that's how you enter into eternity. And some of you will go to kindergarten. <laughs> and you'll have to do night classes. You'll have to like do, you'll have to have accelerated learning with a, a mentor because you didn't learn down here. You're going to, you don't want to be behind because and you just continue on. There are no angels. I checked. There are no angels feeding you grapes up there on clouds. There's, <laughs> there's actually no clouds. There's no clouds in heaven. These guys know that. Condensation nuclei. Charged particles. You, in order to have clouds, you have to have charged dust. There is no dust in heaven. That's why there is no rain before Noah. There was no clouds. There was nothing. The water came up from the earth. It rained because dust went into the air, charged electricity, attracting water, congregating it, and it rained. That's why you have thunder and lightning. There's an exchange from the earth and the clouds. There's all kinds of things going on. But this was not from the beginning. You have a huge chance tonight. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to, I'm going to agree with you right now that w you can't leave here tonight without making a decision and then doing something about it. So I'm going to help you. I want, I want you to say some things. I want you to test your rudder to see if it's working right. Yeah, test your rudder. See, see that it's working. You don't want to get in the air and find out your rudder is not working, so we're going to test it right now. You got to say some things, but you don't say something from your head. You, you, you're not a parrot. You're not repeating something that I said. You're saying something that you understand. That's where the power is. Jesus rose from the dead. That's our only hope. That same power Paul said is dwelling in us right now. It's quickening our mortal bodies. You should not be afraid to die. You should get rid of that and live. Come on now. We can do this. It's just a decision. It's not going to hurt. I 
I sense in this room so much, so much hope, so many good things that God has for us that he wants to insert into your life and beat the living daylights out of the devil. Jesus took dominion over him. He said for us to take dominion over him. He said trample on serpents and scorpions and over the, all the power of the enemy. Nothing by any means shall harm you. Did I quote that right? Yes. Did, I, did I mess it up? Did I? No. no. Jesus said trample on the serpents and scorpions. You have power over all the enemy. Nothing shall by any means harm you, which means you have a good rudder. You can speak. So I want you to say some things right now. Let's spend some time together in prayer. You didn't expect to get out of here early, did you? You obviously don't know me. Burn a lot of fuel to get here, you know. Why waste it? You need to say some things that are born of the Spirit. Okay. The things that are born of the Spirit, if you want to bring Paul into it, in the Bible into it, in, in, in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, it's still in the Bible, I checked. It says that when you pray in the Spirit, your mind does not participate. It says it does not have fruit. It does not give you understanding. Because why? You're speaking mysteries in the Spirit. What else does it say? I'm glad you asked. You're speaking unto God but your mind does not comprehend it. So things that are born of the Spirit can be spoken in your understanding, but most of the time when you pray and the Spirit is praying through you, it is bypassing your brain. Only because what Paul said. Does everybody understand that? Yeah. Okay, everybody understands it? Can I go on? Because that's my introduction. I'm, I'm finally done with my introduction. You've got to grab this. Some things are born of the Spirit and are not to be understood. They bypass your mind. You're ignited in your heart, but you're waiting for the understanding. So, yes, seek understanding. You should acquire understanding. But your next step may be by faith, Amen. which means... You have to say something from the other realm, which is your heart, which is forward looking. In other words, you're leading. If you look at the cheetah, when he is on the prey, he leads the target. That's where they got the technology for the missile guidance systems was based on algorithms of the cheetah, based on the fact that he conserved his movements, and made his prey predictable. You, the tail is a rudder on the cheetah. Now, you know this, don't you? Of course you do. The cheetah is clocked at almost 80 miles an hour. One of the cheetahs that they filmed got higher than that. Now, listen, the cheetah, the steps... The paw prints of the cheetah on a full run are every 22 feet. The measurement says that the cheetah spends 50% of their time in the air on a run. So what are you doing living the low life? I mean, you should be at least 50% in the air. You should be in the spirit 50% of the time, at least. The cheetah has an advantage because it's not afraid to leave the ground. So why are you? The tail is a rudder. The cheetah's tail is a rudder, and it counteracts the next move. The cheetah is already anticipating. And if you look at missile technology, this is what it is. It's hard to get out of missiles these days because of the math. So you are predictable. And you can win. And you can beat the devil. He's not a son of God. 
He's not a child of God. You are. You're children of God. You're his offspring. You have been born of the Spirit. You have the ability to operate in two realms, actually three, physical, spiritual, and the psychological realm. The devil is locked out. He has to hijack you to get you to do something for him. He cannot do anything on his own because he doesn't have a body. When are you going to realize that that's what those evil spirits, they, they were locked out. They were talking to Jesus through people, and they were pleading with him not to send them out of the area. They were pleading with him to not torment them before their time, which means their time has not come yet. And they indicate that they don't want to be cast out of the area. Why? Because they've got that whole area, that whole territory They've got all those people deceived. They've already been working on that group. And they don't want Jesus to send them out of the area because they got to go somewhere else now and work the matrix somewhere else. It takes years to, to get a country to be neutral. <laughs> Human beings are hard to work with, you know. Even with the demonic, they gotta, they got to deceive you because you're smarter. Human beings are hard to deceive because we were made in the image of God. Human beings are hard to kill. Even diseases, it's hard to even get you sick. Your body wants to heal itself. God made us that way. So demons are shut out. You've got to learn to live in the spirit realm as well as in the physical realm. And you've got to understand that your war is here. I mean, if you want to bring the Bible into it, because that's what Paul said. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. Tell us more, Paul. Okay. Paul will say more. To the pulling down of strongholds. What does he say? Every high and mighty thing... Every thought that exalt a thought. Wait a minute. We're talking spiritual warfare here, Paul. And he's talking about the psychological realm. Every thought bringing it into captivity. That word there is incarceration. That means handcuffing it and taking it out under arrest. You got to take every thought, anything it says that exalts itself above what? Oh, knowledge of God. Oh, there's that word, knowledge. The knowledge of God. Anything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. So how are you going to work this if you don't know the manual? How are you going to be able to know what's exalting itself above knowledge that's been given by God? You have to know the manual. You can't compare it unless, what did Jesus say to Satan in the desert? It is written. I mean, the Son of God used the Bible. Maybe you should. <laughs> If Jesus quoted the word of God to the devil, and listen to this, after he was tempted, nobody, nobody has ever s says this. Do you know what it says after he was tempted by the devil? It says that angels came and ministered to him. So if Jesus needed ministered to by angels, then I think you do too. So how, how many of you have been tempted? Don't raise your hand. How many of you are going through temptation right now? Don't raise your hand. No. How many of you feel like the dragon in the book of Revelation has already come to your house? We need to kick him out. When a demon says anything, you have to take that, incarcerate it, and take it out. Handcuff it. Everything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. This is what will change tomorrow for you. What have you been believing? Why are you not believing for angel visitation? I got two more minutes, right? No, it's okay. 
I got a whole week yet. <laughs> I got to pace myself. <laughs> I think we all emotionally let discrepancies affect us to the point where we're paralyzed instead of being problem solvers. I think that all of us, when something doesn't, doesn't work out right, I think we should immediately go to the source of our, our knowledge and understanding, which is the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And I think we should take steps every time to take care of these things and not let them affect us. You should not slow down for the devil. You should not let the devil slow you down. You should not let him create discrepancies or fear. What does the Bible say about fear? It says that fear is torment. It says that Paul said to Timothy, Timothy was a pastor, and Apostle Paul was mentoring him, and he said, Timothy, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of love, power, the sound mind. What, what else does it say? It says that God is love. And it says that perfect love drives out fear. So it, it actually says a person who is perfected in love has no fear. So it's interesting, it's interesting to me that I could get, we call them two by fours, your guys are in some sort of other like measurement, but we have two by fours and they're no longer two by four anymore because they're ripping us off. They're actually like three and a half by one and a half, but you get two by four and I'll lay it across here and I'll say, I'll give a thousand dollars if you can walk across that two by four and not touch the floor, balance yourself. And there'd be a line to do that, not just for the thousand dollars, but most of you could do it. But if I take that and I lay that across the Grand Canyon <laughs> and I give you a million dollars, how many, how deep the line do you think it'll be? How many of you will just go out to eat tonight instead? And pay for it yourself. Okay, so what's the difference? Same two by four. It's a liability. Theoretically, I mean, not getting rid of the wind and birds trying to trip you and things like that. But I mean, in a perfect, in a perfect realm, you should be able to do it. I mean, let's just say it's the same amount. Let's say we stretch it out a certain amount. It's the same length. But one's, you know, you, you drop a mile, and one you, do, you drop the, the, you know, the two inches, or whatever your measurement is. But so, what is it? It's, it's the liability that's in it that you may fail, and because of that, it creates fear. But you watch professionals all the time do things that you can't do but they can do it. And there are people that have done what I just said. There are people who have done it to where if they fail, it's, it's going to be a mess. It's in the news. It's going to be a, like a puff of smoke where they hit. Okay? But they do it. Why? Because they do it all the time right here. Listen, it becomes predictable. It becomes predictable. You eliminate the liability by doing it. So you look at all your heroes. I mean, who would spend their day off trying to get a white ball in a hole <laughs> and think that that's fun? You got to be kidding. You spend your day off. The odds of, of being able to do that 
If you do it twice a week, you can't improve. You just maintain what you got. Three times a week, you start to improve. If you do it every day and take one day off, you can become a professional, but you have to do it every day. You can become a good pilot if you fly every day. You can, you can do anything if you do it all the time and it becomes predictable because it becomes your life. It becomes normal and it eliminates failure. It becomes predictable. Does everybody understand that? It works because you are on the other side of it. It's, it's serving you. But then if you watch a professional do something and it looks so easy and you don't know that that person, that's all they do, then you could be disappointed. But see, with God, he didn't just give some of us the ability to hear his voice. It's going to get hot in here right now. Now, listen to me. Do you know how many people, I mean, you know how many hundreds of thousands of people, listen to me, how many people have heard the message of the gospel? Just me alone, not mention all the other people. Do you know how many people will tell me, and they'll sit with me, and they'll tell me, this is what the devil did to me this week. So they know what the devil's doing. And they'll say, and he said this to me. And they'll be able to quote word for word the exact quote from the devil that he said this week. And all of you can tell me what the devil did to you this week and what he said to you. But when I say, well, what has God said to you this week? Oh, I don't hear God's voice. I go, so you can hear the devil's voice. And he's doing all this stuff to you. And you can give me details, probably like eight by ten glossies, <laughs> photos of the actual event on camera or something. But when it comes to God's voice, you can't hear God's voice. And you can't tell me what God has done for you this week. Oh, it gets better. I have been in services where I was a pastor and I, I handed the mic. It's supposed to be testimony service, which is like, you know, like good things that have happened this week that God helped you, you know. And it turns into this, this is what the devil did to me this week. And they start crying. Becomes open mic night in church. For the devil. Not one. Or, or, please, please help me out here. I'm asking for a friend, but not one angel story. Just all demon stories. So demons are visiting people, but angels are not. Devils are talking to people, but God is not. Pastor Curtis, Mike. You're right, you're right. <laughs> so you, you get up, you say, oh, the devil's really moving this week. He spoke to me, and yeah, this happened. And this is what happened. I started having angel visitation, and when I started sharing it, I got asked to shut up. The churches didn't want to hear it. But I can talk about what the devil's doing. Oh, yeah. Are we on the seventh bowl of wrath, the seventh seal? Has the red dragon come out of the ocean? You know, and you start talking about the end times and, oh, it's going to happen probably tomorrow. And it never happens. <laughs> Do you notice that? You watch all kinds of TV shows and they have all kinds of views. About the Antichrist and about the end, you know, how it's, it's, it's going to happen tomorrow. And yet, if someone gets up and says, God's a good God, and we can change the course of history, we can stop the enemy, and you can have an angel come and help you and speak to you. And I haven't had the devil say a word to me. He doesn't, we don't talk, actually. He doesn't, he doesn't talk anymore. Would he? We don't talk. I don't get along with him. 
No, no I'm, I know you're all laughing, but Pastor, you know, right? You know what I've had to go through is, is I start talking about the fact that Jesus, it says that angels came to minister to him after he was tempted in the desert. And so the Son of God needed ministry after the devil uh, encountered him and, and Jesus encountered him and he enco- the devil encountered Jesus. There was, there was a war and Jesus needed ministry of angels. So why wouldn't we need it? Well, I would need a whole army. And I think you all do too. And so let's all, let's all stand and let's do something with our tongue. How many are done giving the, the devil airtime in your life? Huh? I can't hear you. Yeah, I saw some hands, but are you, do- are you done? Why do you all look taller than me? I thought I was the tallest person in this. What happened? You all stand up and like you're all like three feet higher than me. I'm the shortest person in this. Look, even the camera lady. Look at me. Wait a minute. This isn't fair. I'll sit down. I'm getting a complex. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Now listen, with our tongue, with our tongue, it locates us. Now, the credit card companies know where you are right now. But you don't know where you're at. God knows where you're at. If the credit card companies know where you're at right now, they know I'm right here. And they're going to call when I use my credit card. Oh, we've got some suspicious activity in Zurich. Yeah, you know I'm here. So don't play that with me. You know I'm here. You followed me over the ocean at 603 miles an hour. Well, 603 miles an hour over water. You watched me come here. So God saw, just like the credit card companies see. So he's located you. God knows where you're at right now. But see, your tongue, your words locate you. All right, so once you're on the map and you're all lit up, congratulations, you've been found. Okay, but now we got to go somewhere. Now it's time for a journey. Where do you want to go? Well, you choose. But choose your words wisely because that is how you're going to get there. So where do you want to be tomorrow? Well, I want to be above my choking point today. Do, do Do you want to make that commitment with me? You ready? We're going to talk to God now. And God's going to talk to you. You know what? He's going to answer this prayer. Listen, I'll tell you what. If you want to answer prayer, ask him for wisdom. He'll answer you. Period. If you ask him to watch and help you guard your tongue, he's going to do it. Ready? Ready? You better get ready for answer prayer. Are you ready for the answer? Okay, here we go. Here we go. We're talking to God now, so this is sacred, all right? Father, say it, Father. Father. We come to you in Jesus' name. name. Father, I want to finish my race race. with joy. joy. I want to make you happy, too. So I speak where I'm going. So just like Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Expected end. Plans for you to prosper. So, Father, because you have chosen this path for me, I said, make it done. Make it done. done. Well, I feel better. All right, now we got to activate the angels. Angels of the Lord, Lord. you've been sent to minister minister. for those those who are going to inherit salvation. That's me. Do the Lord's bidding in my life. I expect it.
Raise your hands. This is not an exercise. This is the real thing. Come on now. Receive. You will never be the same again. It's going to get hot in here. Fire from the altar of God. Fire from the altar of God. This is a holy place. The Lord has called you to this holy place. He has chosen you. You are loved. Receive his love right now. Receive his love. Let him love on you. You've, you've done all that you can do. Now you've got to let him love you. Receive him right now. Come on, receive his love. I'll know it. I'll know it when you receive. Let the hurts of this life go. Let it go and forgive. And let him love you right now. He loves you. All of heaven is rejoicing right now. All your loved ones that have gone on, they're cheering you on right now. They've already seen what you will see someday, but they already know. They're cheering you on right now. And they're telling you to run like never before. Don't doubt. Don't fear. That's what they're saying. Come on now. All of heaven is rejoicing. We're all going to do this together, aren't we? We're all going to do this. We're going to win. Just wait on them. You watch what happens in this room. This is a hands-free ministry. I don't have to touch you. God's got a bigger hand anyway. The Lord believes in you. Let him love you. Pastor Curtis, get up here. Let him love you. And Susie, come up here and share. Kathy, too. Susanna. Susanna, come up here. Give her a mic, and Kathy, too. Julia. Susie, you're supposed to share. Where are you? You're released from your job back there. <laughs> <laughs> Speak from the fire, Susie. Right there, Susanna. 
I just feel like the fire of God is... Just pray and then speak. The Lord wants to speak. Kathy, get up here. Take her hand. Speak. Tess. Yes. Yes. Receive. Receive. Uh, don't hold. Just open yourself up. If you're not sure about this, just say, yes, Lord. I receive. Just say, yes, Lord. Whatever you have. Whatever you have. I receive. Yes. I accept it. I, accept. Um, I receive it. I just receive it. And I say yes to everything you have written in the book about yes. me. Everything, everything. Everything. Every page. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness. I thank you. Thank you, Lord. We say yes. Just like Abraham, it said that Abraham staggered not at the promise of God, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. He hoped against hope. So just tell the Lord, Lord, I hope against hope. And when you, he staggered not at the promise of God. So when there was, even there's just like, when um, we're flying that airplane, if that airplane wasn't constantly correcting itself, we wouldn't have landed in Zurich. We would have landed somewhere else. So if you're not constantly correcting your faith in God and checking up on your love for him, and in Revelation it says, return to your first love. Remember where you came from. And that's just a loving reminder to check up. And the way that we can stay on course is by, it says in Philemon that our faith is made effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that's in us in Christ Jesus. So as you just, if you just want to get back to your first love, you know, everything is wonderful what the Lord's doing in our, our midst. But what about if you could have everything you have now, plus the most powerful times you've ever had with him, just to thank him. Remember where you came from. Remember how you got saved. Remember when you first heard the name of Jesus. Remember everything he's done for your family. Just thank him. And it just creates that continual flow. You know, it's just like, I, I just hear him saying, and he was saying this this afternoon too, that if we, we need to be thankful for what we've received and then more will given to him who has more will given. But if, if we're not thankful for what he's already done for us, then he can't give us more. So as we're thankful, that creates his ability to give us more. So let's just thank him. Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we just return to our first love. Lord, you are our heart's desire. You are altogether lovely. There's none like you. You are all glorious. You are victorious. Just lift up your voice and tell him how beautiful he is, how spectacular, how marvelous, how faithful. He's faithful. There's no shadow of turning in him. He's faithful. His word is settled forever in heaven. He's not a man that he should lie. Has he not said it? Will he not do it? He will make it good like he said he would. There will be a performance of the things you have heard of the Lord. He is true. He is faithful, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord. Um, we just, Susie and I and, and all the pastors, we just set ourselves in agreement with every promise that's been made to every per every person who's listening. Every person in this room, we agree, Lord, that there will be a performance of the things they've heard in you, heard from you. We thank you, Lord. Your word is true. We judge you faithful. We just like Sarah, we judge you faithful. We judge you faithful. Ha ha ha. We give you the glory, Lord. We just thank you, Lord. You just seal this evening in in the blood. We thank you for safe travels for everybody. We thank you that this conference continues to hit the mark in your heart. And we just give it, give you the glory and praise the Lord. Yes. Pastor Mike, Pastor standing in for cast, Pastor Curtis. Well, God's just getting started, right? She's right. We need yeah. these sinners. Prayer. Okay. You want me to do it? Okay. All right. All right. Uh, let us pray together before Pastor Mike closes. Just maybe there be somebody here. You came out of curiosity, but you don't really understand. And uh, let's pray together. And we ask the Lord that he will reveal Jesus to you so you can understand. Um, so just repeat with me. Say, dear God in heaven, dear God in heaven. Uh, I heard a lot of things today. 
there may be things I'm not sure about. I ask you to show me. Reveal Jesus to me. Jesus, I invite you into my life. Save me. Be my Lord. Teach me. Help me to understand what I don't understand. Help me understand that you're good and not maybe the way I learned it. So I thank you for accepting me exactly the way I come to you today. And I thank you. Amen. Amen. That was powerful. So listen, if you are getting your heart right back with God, if you've been away from God for a long time, or if this is your first time, I encourage you be here tomorrow because tomorrow is going to be spectacular. God did a lot of work. He's getting a lot of the things out of the soil of our hearts and our lives. Well, tomorrow we want to see the seed get planted inside of you because there's harvest right? There's harvest. So thank you for coming tonight. We look forward to seeing you guys in the morning. We're going to get started around 930, which means we could start a little sooner or a little later whenever the coffee and the chocolate kicks in, right? We'll see you guys in the morning. God bless.